Hey everybody, thank you for choosing to worship with us today. My name is Mingo, I'm the pastor here at Torrey Pines Church, and I'm so thankful uh, that you're worshiping with us today. This is what we're gonna do, we're gonna sing some songs. You're gonna hear some great updates about what's happening around our church and what's happening around the network at large. And then we're gonna kick off a new series in the book of James. I get to bring this first message and I'm super excited about it. Let's worship. Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. All right, in just a minute, we're going to sing an East Lake original that we taught a few weeks back. The song reminds us that grace and love are not deserved, and yet Jesus offers it freely, and we can share it without hesitation. As we prepare to sing this next song, we want to invite you to take the hand of the person next to you if you're sitting next to someone. And we're just going to pray and ask that the love of Christ would fill our hearts and our homes during this time of the world. Then we'll worship together. Let's go ahead and pray. God, that is our prayer right now, that you would fill us completely, that you would fill our hearts and our homes with your love, Lord, and that it would just be overflowing and that it would just reach the people around us, God. Help us to love more like you. We love you and we praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello everyone and thanks for being here today. We are so glad that you and your community are gonna join us for church today. That's right, whether you're watching by yourself with your family or in a neighborhood church, I just wanna say welcome. Uh, and before we move forward and talk about the rest of the experience, I just wanted to press pause and I wanted to celebrate some stuff that's been happening earlier this week, especially since we've been in this season of going to church virtually. We've been really strategic and really trying to look for ways that we can serve and love other people while still abiding by guidelines given to us so that we can be safe and healthy. Yeah, we want to engage, but we also want to just be safe. And this mm -hmm. is how we did it this week. This week, our elementary students were celebrated and blessed with care basket, baskets and personal notes, just reminding them that they're loved and that they're seen as they graduated from one grade to the next. And so if you've got kids in this age range, make plans for them to join us every Saturday for Kids United. It just launched mm -hmm. and it's such a great way for them to be involved and engaged. Yeah, that's right. We also gave out over 200 boxes of food to families this week. That means that we served over 200 families in a tangible and really relevant way. So I wanna say thank you uh, for thinking of people in your circle, for coming on their behalf and really delivering a blessing in the name of Jesus, but also Torrey Pines Church. We also had a blood drive this week uh, with the American Red Cross. And at the mm -hmm. same time, we had enough donors to save 98 lives. Yes. So if you want to call something being the church, that That's is being, the, being church. the church, right? Yeah. Uh, there's several ways every single week that you can serve if you want to partake in any of these community oriented projects. Uh, we've got weekly food distributions happening at this point right mm -hmm. here at Torrey Pines. Uh, ways to bless families directly, and active prayer teams that are connecting with people and families every day of the week. So, how do you get involved? This is how you get involved. Text be the church to 67076 or just email us be the church at torypines.church. That's right. Now, listen, none of these great stories would be told without your generosity. Collectively, we get the opportunity to give through the church and impact people both near and far. I'm always reminded in Matthew 6, 20, where it says this, store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will be also. And, and for us at Torrey Pines Church, the things that we invest in reveals what we treasure as a church, as people, as neighbors, and for our city. Yeah, those are all the people that we cherish here at Torrey Pines Church. And we love serving our community. Uh, we love being the church through our collective generosity by serving together and just showing the love of Jesus to as many people as possible. Now, if you want to give right now, you can actually join us by texting generosity to 67076. You can also visit torypines.church slash give. Go to our church's website and you can just follow the prompts right there. So there's a couple other things happening this week that are going to be coming up that we will want you to know about. That one thing is baptisms. Yes, we have having baptisms. Baptisms are coming back. They're back. Uh, we're going to be having them on June 27th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And I'm sure you're wondering how we can pull these right. off, baptisms mm. together. Uh, we want to let you know that we plan to keep everyone safe and allow families to join with a live video feed. Yeah. And uh, so there's so much more to that. If you'd like more information about baptisms mm -hmm. or how to sign up or reserve your spot, uh, this, you can text BAPTISM to 67076. Six, six. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're also having the second seminar in our growth track process happening online Sunday, June 28th. That's the day after those baptisms are going to happen. And Church 201 is all about growth steps, right? We're going to be introducing you to some great spiritual practices. We're going to be giving you tools needed to keep growing in your relationship with God. Uh, I got to teach part of 101 and it was really special. So, if you'd like more information or if you want to sign up, really simply, I'm going to tell you that number once again, text CHURCH201 to 67076 or you can always email us on anything 
uh, info at torypines.church. That's amazing. 67076. If, right. you didn't, if you didn't catch it by now. <laughs> Today, we are going to be beginning a new series looking at the book of James. Yep. And we have Pastor Mingo, who's going to be bringing the message. We got him back. So uh, just get ready. We're going to jump in together. This is week one of Faith Forward. Let's go. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're watching from home or maybe you're at a neighborhood church, I just wanna tell you how thankful I am that you're choosing to be with us right now. And I wanna ask you a question. Did you know that every year companies collectively will spend billions of dollars in advertising and marketing because they wanna repeat their message enough times so that it gets cemented in your brain? Did you know that? Then, when you go to purchase something, let's say in the category of whatever company that is, you end up choosing them either subconsciously or because you're familiar with that brand because of how much marketing they've thrown at you. So to prove this point and as a way to kick off today's message, I want to start with a little at-home game challenge. So uh, if you're watching by yourself, you win. But if you're watching with somebody else, I'm going to tell you a slogan, uh, and then you have to guess the company or the product. I want you to keep score, and then the first person to say the correct answer out loud is the person that's going to get a point. So there's only six of these, so I want you to get ready. Uh, and let's see who wins, ready? So the first one, number one, here's the slogan. The happiest place on earth. Did you guess Disneyland? Because that's the answer, right? That's their slogan, the happiest place on earth. Here's number two, ready? Number two, the ultimate driving machine. Do you know whose slogan that is? If you guessed BMW, you guessed right. Uh, it's been a long time since I saw a BMW commercial, but that's usually how they tag everything. Now, here's number three. Uh, you're going to know it. A famous actor. Their slogan goes, what's in your wallet? Do you know which one that is? It's actually Capital One. Uh, if you guess Capital One, you got it right. And then here's number four. Ready? Number four. Uh, I like this one because it's tricky and they've got really great commercials right now. Number four slogan goes like this. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. You want to say it again? We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. If you guessed farmer's insurance, you guessed right. And am I right? They have the best commercials. Now, number five and number six are for all the candy lovers watching right now. Uh, number five goes like this. The milk chocolate melts in your mouth, not in your hands. That's right. You probably finished it for me. Did you know that Eminem, which is the answer to that slogan, they are that slogan, they've been saying that message since 1954. That's over 70 years they've been throwing that slogan at you so that you would choose M&Ms when you choose chocolate next. Okay, the last one, taste the rainbow, right? If you guess Skittles, you guess correctly. Figure out who wins. They get to eat for free. Everybody else has to pay for lunch. So um, advertising 101 is literally to repeat a message enough times eventually so that people will remember it, so they'll recognize it, and eventually they'll act on it. And as we kick off this new series today called Faith Forward, we're going to be studying through the book of James. And you're actually going to see that this is the exact same strategy that James, the half-brother of Jesus, uses in his letter to all the people reading. He touches on a ton of different topics, but he comes back time and time again to one big idea, really one central theme that he wants to get across to every reader. So... As we begin, I want to give you this big idea in the book of James. And if you're taking notes, maybe you've got the app. I want you to open them up right now. And I want you to write this down because this is the big idea for our series and the big idea for uh, today's message. It's simply this, that authentic faith is not something that you just think or feel or say, but authentic faith actually moves you to do the book of James is all about action. It's a, a faith that does, a faith that moves, and specifically, it's a faith that moves forward. This is why so many people love the book of James, because it's so straightforward. Now, over and over again in this little five-chapter letter, James makes this point that a faith separated from application and a faith that's separated from action is actually worthless. It's no value to you, and it's no value to the people that God puts around you in the season that you're in right now. 
James also lets us know that faith is more than just a set of beliefs, right? Believing is great, but believing is not the goal for us in our entire lives, right? Feeling is also not the goal. So faith, our faith specifically, should make us feel something, right? I want you to feel when we get together and when we worship, when uh, we teach and we hear God's word over us. I want us to feel something, but feelings only matter if they actually lead us to doing something. You're going to see that James makes this same point as you read through the book. The faith isn't just something that you say. It's not just knowing a few Bible verses and maybe posting them on Facebook when you feel like the world needs your opinion. There's a lot of that right now. But real faith, authentic faith, is an actionable Step. It's all about action. This uh, is said super clearly in our theme verse for Faith Forward this series. And really the message of the entire book of James. Uh, I want us to read it out loud together. So uh, I'll put it up on the screen and then we can read collectively as a group. James 122 reads this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I love a short, punchy verse, and James is giving it to all of us just straight on, right? This is what faith forward is all about. We want to be doers, not just hearers of the word. Uh, we don't want to just read scripture or listen to a sermon or listen to a podcast about a sermon and then go and live the exact same way that we were before. We want to actually apply God's truth to our lives. We want to live it out. I want to apply God's truth to my life. I want to live it out. I want a faith that moves me forward, that moves us as a church forward, not one that leaves us the same week in and week out. There's another way to understand this big idea, and uh, I think that this will be easy. It'll be easier to click in your mind. And it says this, that authentic faith is an outward expression of our inward devotion. Now, let me say that again, right? Authentic faith is an outward expression of a pre-existing inward devotion. It's something that you have that is naturally expressed out to the people and to the places and to the things that you're naturally connected to in everyday life. James is going to make this exact same point over and over and over again throughout his entire letter. That if we really have faith inside of us, if we naturally show um, who we are, that it, our faith, will naturally show itself on the outside. It reveals itself in the way that we live, the way that we see others, the way that we serve others, the way that we talk, the way that we control ourselves, the way that we give, the way we receive. If Jesus is in us, his life should be showing through us every day as long as we're submitting ourselves to him. So for the next several weeks, we're going to actually work our way through the entire book of James section by section. It's just five really short chapters. So you could easily read it tonight, today, this afternoon, this morning in one setting. And I honestly, I want to encourage you to do so. And I want to encourage you to read it several times as we're in this series because more and more will pop out at you, I promise. Today though, we're going to start at looking at the beginning and we're going to look at the first few verses. But before we read them, I just want to like put a warning out there that he starts the letter with some words that I think most of us, if we were writing this letter, we would have chosen to like tuck it away. Maybe in the last chapter, maybe we would have taken it as like a PS on the last page, would have turned it over and written this last note because he tackles one of the toughest subjects and one of the biggest uh, questions of faith in Jesus. He does it right at the beginning. So let's take a look at how he starts this letter. James 1, 1 through 8 reads this. It says, From James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, is to all of God's people who are scattered everywhere in the world, greetings. My brothers and sisters, when you have many kinds of troubles, you should be full of joy because you know that these troubles test your faith and this will give you patience. Let your patience show itself perfectly in what you do. Then you'll be perfect and complete and will have everything you need. 
But if any of you needs wisdom, you should ask God for it. He's generous to everyone and will give you wisdom without criticizing you. But when you ask God, you must believe and not doubt. Anyone who doubts is like a wave in the sea blown up and down by the wind. Such doubters are thinking two different things at the same time, and they cannot decide about anything they do. They should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. The reason James starts his letter talking about how we handle trouble is because who he's writing this letter to. He's writing this to Jewish Christians who are scattered because of persecution. These are Jews who had actually just discovered Jesus as the Messiah. And I'm sure they thought life could not be better than this. But then they go to the synagogue where they'd always gone for worship. And now they find that they're the outcast because of their new faith in Jesus. And then persecution of Christians breaks out at a societal level. And many of them had to leave their homes their families, and now they're scattered all around the same region. And obviously, these Jesus followers are beginning to ask the same questions that I think you and I ask when troubles come our way, right? They say, hey, God, like, where are you? I thought you were good. I thought you were good, God. I thought you'd never leave me. Uh, I have prayed about this for weeks, and now nothing, Jesus. It sure feels like I'm out here all by myself. You see, the culture and the religion that they grew up in taught them this, that If good things are happening to you, you found favor with God that you're actually blessed. But if bad things are happening to you, that you've actually fallen out of favor with God, you might even be cursed. So here's a group of people who are brand new in their faith, and they're drawing the conclusion that something is wrong with me or something is wrong with God because of the troubles that they're experiencing. Isn't that the same response we usually have, or is it just me, right? And James says, oh, no, 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 no. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing is actually wrong with God. And he tackles this tough question head on. James understands something about faith. And it's that faith, like a muscle, has to be tested in order to grow. Let me say that again. Faith is like a muscle. It has to be tested to grow. Now, I know you're looking at me. And yes, it's true. I know muscles, right? Well, I know people who know muscles and who actually work on their muscles. And what do they do in order to work on their muscles? They feed it ice cream every day. No, they don't do that. They work out their muscles. They fatigue them. They exhaust them. They give them stress and tension. Uh, And through exercise, they rest and then they allow it to recover and grow. I know this idea makes Uh, a sense in this at a head level, right? It makes sense that the way we grow our muscles is that we stress and we strain them, but it's hard to accept it here at a heart level. Uh, I think it was probably hard for those first Jewish Christians to accept this also because it ran counter to the culture that they were raised in. This idea runs counter to our own culture as well. We live in a culture that is all about safety, right? Car seats, bike helmets, airbags, choking hazards on every toy for every kid. Uh, When I was a kid, uh, you learned how to swim by accidentally falling into the pool, right? We rode bikes without helmets. Uh, We had car seats uh, that weren't click-ins, right? Our car seat was our parents' arm across our face when they slammed on the brakes. Those were better days. But James is telling us that God is so interested in us having strong faith muscles that he's going to allow circumstances to stretch our faith. That God is actually going to use trials and troubles that are actually going to push us, even exhaust some of us, so that in the end, when we have uh, nothing left, seemingly, we actually find ourselves with active, strong faith. Today is different, right? We're so obsessed with uh, safety and comfort that it's hard for us to grasp the idea of a God who actually would allow trouble when we live in a culture of caution that it so falsely promises this illusion of security. Uh, I talk about John often, right? John, our pastor over experience and environments. And uh, he was deployed in the Marines uh, on uh, tour of duty in the Middle East and John always talks when I ask him about his stories about how his, his comfort and his preference and his safety, they were not the top priority uh, while he was on mission. That mission completion 
was the top priority. He said that he would have never have found himself on his own decision uh, in any of the places that he spent, right? Places well over 100 degrees, super uncomfortable where he was. The mission was the most important thing for John. There are goals and there are priorities that oftentimes are more important than the complete comfort or safety of you or me. The same, I think, is true in our spiritual life, right? That God's not trying to make trouble for us. He's not causing most of our troubles or he's playing games with our lives. He's actually using them to shape and to build our character, to grow our faith. So with this understanding about God and about our troubles, how should we respond to our troubles? How should we respond in our troubles? I want to give you three quick, I think, actionable ways that you can take and you can work this out this week. Uh, The first one is this, choose joy through them, right? Choose joy through them. Verse two says it all, that we all have some trouble that we're experiencing right now. We're in the middle of a global pandemic still, right? We're seeing wounds of racism that need to be healed and changes that need to come with that. I'm sure every one of us could name two, three, probably 10 personal challenges that we're facing right now on top of all those things, whether it's our health, our marriage, our financial situation. And in the middle of all of this, what do we do? It seems strange, I think, to say, well, we just choose joy, don't we? Unless I think you understand what James is saying. Psalms 34.1 tells us, it actually says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I'll consistently speak his praises. He's saying we can actually choose joy when we see the bigger picture. When we realize that God is working good through all things, joy is actually an option. Now, I'm not saying you choose joy in your troubles. This isn't like some weird hyper-spiritual faith that denies reality or denies pain or emotion. Uh, I'm not rejoicing for trouble and I'm not choosing joy uh, as trouble presents itself. What I'm doing is I'm choosing joy as I move through my troubles. Every time I see somebody going through something so intense like the loss of a loved one and yet their sights are set on Jesus, I know that they are choosing joy. I know that they see God as good. And even though what's in front of them is probably the most challenging thing, they choose joy through their scenario. It allows them to say that, God, you are good. And what I saw and what I'm experiencing right now, I don't get, but I know that you are at the center of this. So I think an authentic faith that moves people forward is a faith that chooses joy, even in trouble. And I think this is what James is alluding to. The second one is that in your troubles that you ask for wisdom while you're in your trouble. Look at verse five, right? Ultimately, God's wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. He has a perspective, I think, that we can't see on our own. And he also has purposes that oftentimes we don't understand. So we pray to God for his wisdom. We trust him to help us navigate, right, these difficult seasons and these choices. I think all too often we find ourselves in times of trouble or difficulty, and we actually end up asking God for his help as a last resort, not our first option. We try to fix things. We try to solve things. We get out of it. We get in and we try to use our own wisdom and we use our own choices. And then when we come to the end of ourselves and we're stressed out and we're fatigued, we finally invite God in. James is saying, ask God for wisdom right away. James reminds us that when we ask God, that God gives us generously, right? He gives to us generously. God isn't stingy. He's not holding out on us or he's holding back from us. The Bible says that he's with us in our troubles and he'll lead us through them and even uh, use those troubles to develop our character and our faith, our faith muscles. That's why this last step I think is so important, right? Number three is to rely on God all the way, not some of the way, not at the beginning or maybe at the end. Uh, Verse six through eight shows us that we don't rely on our own wisdom or our own strength that we first have to fully trust God. This is what James is talking about in verses six through eight. 
Let me show it to you again. I'll read it. Ready? It says this. But when you ask God, you must believe and not doubt. Anybody who doubts is like a wave in the sea blown up and down by the wind. Such doubters are thinking two different things at the same time, and they can't decide about anything they do. They shouldn't think, they should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. It's like a, a bold, very right out statement. What James is talking about is the person who does this, right? The person who says, when things are great, oh, isn't God so good? Look how great he is. And then when things are bad, we wonder if there's even a God, right? And when things are, are going good again, we, we love Jesus. We sing about him. We're the first to declare his name. We post something on Facebook. We talk about how blessed we are. But then when things start to slide in the direction we don't want them to, all that goes out the window. I think what he's saying here is that when we go through trials, uh, when we ask God for his wisdom, his perspective, we do it from a place of belief. We go to God from the vantage point of, God, I still trust you. God, I still believe in you. I don't like this. I don't understand this. But I'm not throwing in the towel and I'm not going to play games with you, right? People who play games are like, God, if you do this, I'll do this. If you don't let this happen, then I'll whatever, fill in the blank. People who honestly come to God and just say, God, I trust you and I am totally reliant on you find themselves developing these faith muscles. So here's the bottom line. And here's really the truth, I think, in this passage here today. As we start this whole series, adversity is not a sign that God is absent. Adversity is actually a sign that God is active. This is an invitation to embrace a whole new perspective, that we realize that God has not actually abandoned us when troubles come, but rather God is growing us through the troubles that come. God is working our faith muscles to bring us to maturity and completeness in him. Here's how James says it at the end of this section in verse 12. He says in James 1:12, "Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him." We're going to close today with a song and uh, the song is called Graves into Gardens. And it's a new song. We want to teach it to you. We want to sing it with you. And it speaks this idea that worshiping God fully and celebrating that He is a God who takes care of our troubles, our trials, our brokenness, that He can turn them to good, that He turns graves in our lives into gardens, beauty on display for the world to see. If you'd let me right now, I'd love to pray for you right where you're at over the things that you're going through. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that we would experience your love and your peace in this moment. I do pray, Lord, that we would choose joy, that we would ask for wisdom from you. Lord, that we would trust that you're working for good in our lives right now. Lord, there's so much going on, Lord. There's tension in our nation. There's epidemic that we're still navigating through. And in all of these things, Jesus, we ask that you would show us how you're developing us, how you're walking with us, how you're strengthening us. Lord, we believe deeply, authentically that you can turn a grave into a garden. Lord, would this be our testimony as we sing together right now? We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's worship together. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Men's empty breaths, treasures of fame are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, cause there's nothing better. Cause there's nothing 
If you made a decision today to follow Jesus for the first time, I want to invite you to take a really easy next step. You can text us, New Start to 67076. We'd love to email you 
um, and just have a conversation with you, maybe send you some resources as you begin this new walk with Jesus. I wanna tell you about ways that you can get connected to the community here at Torrey Pines Church and really just celebrate all that God is doing in this moment in your life. Uh, so again, if you wanted to text us, new start to 67076, or you could just write it in the comment section below. And uh, one of our teammates, one of our family members here at Torrey Pines Church will get in contact with you and walk with you through the next season. Love you. I'll talk to you guys soon.